This is the Transforming Anxiety Podcast with Kelly Hanlon McCormick, and today is episode number 195, Protect Your Headspace. Welcome to Transforming Anxiety. I'm your host, Kelly McCormick. I'm a mom to two boys, a wife, friend, daughter, and sister, and I'm a certified life coach, yoga teacher, and soon-to-be mindfulness meditation teacher. I'm no stranger to anxiety, and I'm here to teach you how to manage your mind and your emotions so that you too can transform anxiety into calm, peace, and whatever you want for your life. I'm so glad you're here. Hey there, welcome on in today. Oh. I hope this finds you well. If you're in the States, we're post Thanksgiving everywhere. We're kind of staring down the end of the year, Christmas, New Year's, all the things. I hope you're doing well. I know this time of year tends to be kind of a wild ride, (laughs) even in the best of circumstances. So I hope that you're doing all right, that that your mind is feeling somewhat clear and clean that your heart is feeling light, and that you're checking in with yourself, taking care of yourself. So today we're going to talk about protecting your headspace. And to get into the spirit of this one, I want you to picture your mind as a really big plot of land, like maybe the size of a small city. And your mind has all this real estate, right? Think of it almost as like the different zones of a city, right? A city has commercial and residential and industrial zones, right? You can't just build willy-nilly. There are certain places for certain kinds of things. Houses go here, businesses go here, factories go over there. And in your mind, there are allotments for different things. Work, family, friendships, your romantic partner, hobbies, travel, you name it. I know this isn't how your brain actually works. (laughs) We're using a metaphor. So just like an actual city, your mind has limited real estate. It doesn't just go on forever. You've likely noticed this because you know that you only have so much bandwidth, right? You can only think of a certain amount of things. You can only manage so much. I know you've all experienced that if you're here, right? So what do I want to explore today is protecting that headspace, being a really strict border guard for what comes into the real estate of your mind, being intentionally selective about it, because the space up there is not infinite. And what you fill your headspace with, it matters. As they say, where your attention goes, your energy flows. What you fill your mind with is what will become your reality. If you're focused on something, if you're spending time with something, if you're allowing something into your headspace, it will become a part of your life. That's inevitable. So it's pretty important to protect your headspace and fill the real estate of your mind with things that really matter to you, with what you want. Okay, so I want to break this into things we can all universally protect our headspace from. Or rather, maybe it's just elements in our modern everyday lives that we need to stay aware of and just notice. Put these areas through the filter of how am I protecting my headspace here? Am I protecting my headspace? Have I let something in that I want to remove? Is there something taking up real estate in my mind that I'd rather demolish so that I can make room for something more me? All right, the first one is protect your headspace from devices. (laughs) Matt Haig wrote this in his book. This is an excellent book. It's called Notes on a Nervous Planet. This is what he says. How to own a smartphone and still be a functioning human being. Don't feel you always have to be there. In the not-so-olden days of letters and landlines, contacting someone was slow and unreliable and an effort. In the age of WhatsApp and Messenger, it's free and easy and instant. The flip side of this ease is that we are expected to be there, 
to pick up the phone, to get back to the text, to answer the email, to update our social media. But we can choose not to feel that obligation. We can sometimes just let them wait. We can risk our social media getting stale. And if our friends are friends, they will understand when we need some headspace. And if they aren't friends, why bother getting back anyway? Turn off notifications. This is essential. This keeps me just about sane. All of them, all notifications. You don't need any of them. Take back control. All right, so maybe you saw this one coming, right? (laughs) Devices, our phones, these are a biggie right now. We buy these things so they can be handy tools for us to use. We buy them to make our lives easier so that we can stay connected to the people that we love, to the people that we work with, to the world. And we become absolutely yoked to them. It's like we work for them. I know you've heard this before. I know this isn't brand new information. But please, take a moment to just reconsider how you interact with your device. The notifications, the updates, how you receive and respond to messages, what you use your device for, how often you pick it up, how frequently it blocks you from being present, paying attention, being with people in real life. If you could make one change with your device and protect one square inch of mental real estate in a new way from being totally steamrolled by your phone, how would you do that? What could you change? This is just really good to consider, right? All right, next, protect your headspace from idle thoughts. So Beatrice Williams wrote this. This is from her novel, Coco Beach. She wrote, long ago, I had learned that you could imagine anything you wanted, that the space inside your head belonged to you furnished and decorated and inhabited only by you so that your insides teemed and seethed while your outward aspect remained serene. All right, so that last part of the quote is like a whole different thing that we could explore. And I've talked about this care or I've talked about this before, this idea about carefully curating your life, right? What you read, what you do, who you're surrounded by. And this feels pretty closely akin to that. Curate what you would hang on the walls of your mind. So here we go to mix metaphors here. If your brain is a gallery, what are you going to put on the walls? What do you want to purposefully pick out and arrange to take up space on the walls of your brain? Your mind is furnished and decorated and inhabited only by you. You can imagine anything you want. You can choose anything you want. The thoughts, the beliefs, the opinions, the ideas, the stories, the images, all of it is curated by you. And here's the kicker. It's curated by you whether you're paying attention or not. Even if you don't consciously choose what's going into your headspace, it's still under your jurisdiction. It's furnished, decorated, and inhabited only by you. So I say here to protect your headspace from idle thoughts. And I guess I mean, check in on those ideas that have just always been lurking around. Those framed photos that have always been hanging in the gallery of your mind. See them with fresh eyes. Would you choose them again? Do they work for you? Do you want them? The idle thoughts that you think just because you've always thought them. Be willing to revisit those. Be willing to freshen things up. Recurate your mind. Protect your headspace from old stuff, from idle stuff that isn't serving you. All right, next, protect your headspace from getting all overly excited about control specifically control of the outside external world. So Ben Hunt Davis, who is an Olympic rower, he wrote this. 
We all have limited time, energy, and headspace. So devote those precious resources into dealing with things inside your control and let go of anything you can't do anything about. Now, again, this is something I talk about a lot. This is not new information if you've been hanging out here, right? Discerning what you can control from what you can't control. And just like Hunt Davis says, we all have limited time, energy, and headspace. Those are your most precious natural resources as a human being, by far. Don't squander them on things that are completely outside of your control. For instance, other people. What other people say and do. What they expect from you. Their opinions and thoughts and feelings, even if that is seemingly about you. It's never about you, by the way. Other people's thoughts and feelings are about them. They're never about you. (laughs) Just so you know. All of it, though. All of that's 100% out of your control. The news, politics, current events, global pandemics, not under your control. Gotta just let go, let go, let go. Your kids, this is a biggie. Your kids are not mini-me's. They're not yours to like mold and shape and force into being a certain way. We get to teach them, we get to guide them, and we get to find out who they are. And then help them be more of that. It's out of our control who our kids are. Are you with me? So things we can control. You ready? It's pretty simple. But it's powerful. So it's good news that it's simple. How you think, how you feel to a large extent, and how you show up in the world. So listen, your mind is going to think thoughts. Sure some wild thoughts, some petty thoughts, some judgmental thoughts, you get to choose which of those to live into, which of those thoughts you want to be. And pro tip, you can intentionally plant thoughts in your mind. You can choose how you want to think on purpose and then think that way. You have authority there. Control, right? Now, how you feel is a little more slippery. Emotions come from a lot of places. But the majority of how you're feeling comes from how you're thinking. Maybe like, I don't know, 80% of your emotions come from what's on your mind. It's highly scientific fact right there. (laughs) But whatever it is, you can sense this for yourself, right? Where your mind is focused, that's how you're feeling. If someone tells you how they're thinking, there's a pretty good chance you can guess how they're feeling, right? Feelings follow thoughts pretty closely. But for sure, for sure, how you are in the world, this one is 100% under your control. Your mind may think wild thoughts that you need to sift through and get choosy about. Your heart may feel things that make sense or not. But what you do, what you say, how you are in the world, who you show up as, that one is always down to you. That one's 100% your choices, your responsibility. So let go where you don't have control. All those things that take up real estate in your mind that you couldn't possibly change or shift if you tried as hard as you could. And then take full control where you have it, how you're thinking feeling, and behaving. So make sure your headspace has room for that work. Room to be aware of your thoughts, to process your emotions, and to pause so that you can show up in the world how you want to. All right, then protect your headspace from unnecessary negative thoughts. So Val Emick, I might be saying that wrong, he writes young adult novels, and he wrote this. I also know that when you're not in the best headspace, the trivial can turn into the insurmountable, and all of a sudden you're heading down a dark path and you can't find your way back. Huh, we've all been there, right? Down the path of the insurmountable, and then you're in a dark, dark wood and you can't find your way back. 
if you can protect your headspace from this kind of thinking sooner than later, before you head all the way down that dark path, then you're on to something. So we've talked about those idle thoughts, right? The old stuff that's just in there. And this is similar, but it's like there's a little more juice to it, right? The all out negative stuff. When you're beating yourself up, when you're hating someone, when you're telling yourself it'll never work about a work deadline or a project you want to finish, those negative thoughts protect your headspace from them. And for sure, be on to yourself when you're turning something trivial into the insurmountable. That's optional. Don't suffer over that stuff. It is wholly unnecessary. All right, so you know I saved the best for last. (laughs) Protect your headspace from people. You knew this one was coming. So Jen Sincero, she wrote this in her book, How to Be a Badass. She says, when you hang out with whiners, pessimists, tweakers, bleakers, freaker outers, and life is so unfairers, it's an uphill climb to keep yourself in a positive headspace. Stay away from people who see limitless possibility as the reality. Surround yourself with people who act on their big ideas, who take action on making positive change in the world, and who see nothing as out of their reach. So listen, we could for sure talk a whole episode about this because just saying protect your headspace from people, (laughs) like that doesn't quite get at all the complexities here, right? This is other people's thoughts, people's expectations, people's attitudes and their own desires and ways of being, right? This is like protecting yourself from all of the ways that other people show up that aren't you, that don't work for you. People who complain or bring you down. People who trigger self-doubt in you. Protect your headspace from anything that doesn't serve you. Anyone that isn't naturally curious about who you are and what you want for yourself. Anything that anyone that comes in like guns blazing, telling you about yourself, that's not for you. Protect yourself from that. Protect your headspace from all of those thoughts, all of those ideas and opinions. You don't need that. You know you. You're your own best guide, always. You're the expert on you. You need people around you who ask questions and can help bring that stuff out into the light so that you can see it. And that's all, right? All right, so protecting your headspace. Picture your mind like a plot of land or a gallery or a small city because we used all the things, right? Whatever works best for you here and protect the hell out of it. It's your number one job. Whatever's going on in your mind, it's running your life. So this is a place to be careful. This is a place to be aware Be willing to experiment and then change your mind, right? Be willing to move on when you've had enough. Be willing to just stay aware of it all. All right. End of November, folks. I will see you again at the same time, same place next week for more Transforming Anxiety. And until then, please take care. Do you have someone to help you with your stress, anxiety, worry, and overwhelm? If not, I would love to be your coach. The Fierce Calm Project is my virtual coaching program where we get to go in on topics like this one, and I can help you apply these lessons to your life so that you are creating your own transformation. We do live coaching calls, guided meditations, on-demand yoga classes, We hold book club where we read books your neighborhood book club won't. And there's lots of bonus content that I've created just for you. When you're ready to take what you're learning on the podcast to a whole other level, then come on over and check out the Fierce Calm Project at kellyhanlonmccormick.com slash Fierce Calm Project.